Okay, Rabbi Freundlich, nice to see you. Welcome. Thank you. The Torn Motion, and uh, a pleasure to have you. Rabbi Freundlich has been rabbi at TBDJ, as it's known. That's how I knew growing up, going to Bnei Akiva Shabbatons, one year in Toronto, one year in Montreal, on Simchas Torah, the Bailey Shul, on uh, Tiferet Bet David Yerushalayim, and the uh, major shul in Montreal. You've been there, I really I cannot believe it's five years, since 2016, after every served for seven years as the assistant rabbi in Atlanta, in, Re in Rabbi Feldman Shul. First, of course, That's the correct. father, then the son Shul, and the, um, a graduate of Neri Israel in Baltimore, a degree in pastoral counseling. And we're gonna find out very soon how much French he's learned, because I decided in keeping with like Bill 101 and living in Quebec, we should have this year today in, in French. I, if I didn't warn you in advance, I didn't warn anybody else either. So, bakasha. <laughs> I am totally ready for a sheer in French. You ready? Here it goes. <laughs> Bonjour, au revoir. Okay. We're done. Okay. That's the entirety have, of my French. You got it all. Have Have you picked up any? I assume your kids, I'm sure, I'm sure, speak French. My kids are picking it up a little bit. Um, I have got nothing. Zero. No. Oh. No French. Okay. <laughs> I okay. live in a little. I live in my bubble, Cote Saint Luc. I don't have any French. I don't hear French. I know nothing from French. Okay. Shalom aleichem, my friend. Ah, no. So nice okay. to see you. Okay, Bakasha, we can we can get started. It's all yours. You can share a screen when, if and when you please. Okay, I will share a screen. It's nice to see everyone. It's so nice to be here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for. Uh, okay, I can't remember. Uh, one second. I'm sorry, I'm just getting back to my group here. Okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. Parshas Korach, it's really a treat to be uh, to be part of this group. I see so many emails I get from Rabbi Kelman uh, addressing so many important issues I hear. I get all the announcements of all of these shiurim, and then all of a sudden he sent me an email, would you like to give a shiur? I can't believe it to be a part of this wonderful program. It was really such an honor um, and really a very special privilege for me to be able to do so. So let's talk a little bit about Parshas Korach. What I'd like to share this evening is a comment from the Ramban. Uh, it's a magnificent comment addressing a very specific aspect of our Parsha. We're going to really start in the middle of the story, and then we'll, of course, have to go back and fill in some of the points regarding this particular Parsha. But let me just give a brief synopsis to get us into the middle, at least, so that we could start in the middle. This is, of course, the story of the rebellion of Korach. Korach, together with a few cohorts of his, Dasan and Aviram, together with 250 leaders, uh, basically rebel against the authority of Moshe, which is rebelling against the authority of Hashem himself, claiming that they make a number of different claims. We'll see a bunch of them, uh, that Moshe took the authority for himself, then nepotism, he gave it to his brother Aaron to be the Kohen Gadol. And then, of course, they made the Levium in place of the firstborns. Originally, the firstborns would be the, the ones serving in the in the Mishkan or the Beis HaMikdash, and then it was taken away and given to the Levi, and they levy all of these charges, so to speak, against Moshe and against uh, Aharon. Uh, Moshe has a, in it, a little test that they're going to do. Every person is going to take a fire pan, and they'll put some incense in, and Hashem's heavenly fire will actually determine who is indeed the appropriately chosen Kohen Gadol. All of these things go on in the beginning of the Parsha, which we're going to skip right through. We are going to pick up in Hashem's anger at the people, his disbelief that yet again, we have another complaint against uh, his authority against Moshe and Hashem opens up. I'm gonna share my screen at this point so we can look at it inside. Do not be friend. There's a lot, of, a lot of sources here and a lot of Hebrew here. We're gonna go through everything. I'm gonna translate everything. This is just a guide for me to make sure that we cover all of the points. For those of you who like seeing sources inside, you have them, but don't be frightened by the, uh, by the, uh, by the sheet. This is in the middle of our story, right at the end, the Pesach begins here in Pesach, Yitesh Vayakel Aleim Korach as Kol El Pesach O El Moe. Korach gathered the whole community to the tent of meetings for the big test the big showdown, to see what's going to happen in this debate between Korach leading this revolt against Moshe, and he gathers everyone together, Eskol Ha'eda. This is an important phrase. He's now gotten the entirety of the Jewish people involved in this big showdown. And then Hashem's presence appears, so that it's no longer just the people fighting it out, Hashem's presence appears, and Hashem has something powerful to say to Moshe and to Aaron in Pasuk Chaf, verse 20, So he only speaks to Moshe and Aaron, 
but it's in the presence of everyone that Korach has gathered together. And he says to them, he badlu mitocha edo hazos. Separate yourself from this congregation. Va'achale osam keroga. I want to destroy them. I'm finished. I've had it with them. Which congregation is he referring to when he says, when Hashem says to Moshe and Aaron, separate yourself from this congregation. So the Ramban writes very clearly that that's the Jewish people. It's not just Korach's congregation. This is the entire, separate from the Jewish people, Hashem says to Moshe. Move aside, I'm wiping them out, all of them. Now, this is not the first time that Hashem has threatened to destroy the Jewish people. Uh, we've seen it as recently as last week's parsha. At the in the sin of the spies, we've seen this claim before. And Moshe here makes a different argument than we've seen elsewhere when Hashem threatens to destroy the Jewish people. You might be familiar with the claim that sounds something like this. Moshe says, you, you can't do that. What are they going to say back in Egypt? The Cairo Gazette is going to say, God ran out of power. You remember that claim? Moshe makes that claim a couple of times. That's not what he says here. Here we have the entire people gathered together. Korach is riling them up. And Hashem says to Moshe and to Aaron, separate, I'm going to destroy them. Moshe and Aaron fall on their faces. And they say, You God, the source of all living beings. And here's their argument. Could it be that one person sins? One person. And you're going to get angry at everyone. That's fair. One person makes a mistake and everyone pays the punishment. Collateral damage. We don't believe in that. Moshe and Aaron say can't be that one person can sin and everybody can absorb the punishment of that one person. So can go on and Hashem accepts that and leaves the people alone. This is our discussion for tonight. What is this dialogue? This is a very odd dialogue. And, and in the words, as the Ramban asks his question of, I don't understand, he says, did the people do something wrong or not? Did they deserve to be punished or not? If Hashem opens the dialogue by saying, I'm going to destroy them all, it would seem logical that they've done something worthy of destruction. There's no way an entire nation is going to be destroyed if they didn't do something wrong. They have to have done something wrong or Hashem wouldn't threaten destruction. And if they did do something wrong, then what's Moshe's argument when he says, hey, 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 only one person sinned. How could you punish them all for the sin of one person? What was Hashem thinking? One person sinned and I'm going to punish everybody because of one? That doesn't make any sense. What is this dialogue? What did Hashem think when he said, I'm destroying them all? And what's Moshe's argument when he says it's only one person? That's the, our question for tonight. To appreciate the Ramban's comment in addressing this issue, we need to go back now a little bit to the beginning of the story and really understand a little bit what is going on. This is such a rich parsha. There's so many aspects of this rebellion, so many lessons for us to learn. Um, let's focus on a couple here as we go through. Um, again, the, the, I'm not reading through all of these sources. They're in front of you, but that's, it's really just a, uh, a guideline. The first question that we need to address uh, as we go back to the beginning, in order to get to the middle here, is the timing of this particular rebellion. The, the problems, again, that Korach raises, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but just in the simple running through of what the issues are, we have a problem of the authority of Moshe, Aharon is chosen as the Kohen Gadol, the firstborns are chosen to replace the Levim. There's a lot of Levi-centric issues here. The issue is the timing where the Torah tells us this. As you remember, of course, last week we read Parsha Shlach. Parsha Shlach picks up a full year after the Jews arrive at Harsinai. Um, they're there for almost an entire year. And then they begin their journey to Eretz Yisrael, which really happened at the end of the previous Parsha, Bahaloscha. After they're there a full year at the foot of Mount Sinai, they spend time building the Mishkan. Moshe is teaching them Torah. It's a great existence. And then finally, Hashem says, no, it's time to go. And as by Ibn so Aaron, we read about as the Aaron traveled, we had a number of problems. They, they complained about the man. They complained about the meat. We had a couple of issues along the way. And then they send spies. What should have been a quick journey into the land of Israel ends in a total debacle of last week's Parsha of the spies. 
And then we read our Parsha of Korach. When did this rebellion of Korach take place? When did it happen, chronologically speaking? Where should we place it on the timeline? It would be tempting to put it earlier, out of order, put it back while the Jews were at Harsinai over the course of the year. And the reason why it's tempting to put it backwards is because all of the issues that Korach raises became issues months earlier, during that time, after they arrive in Harsinai, that's when Aaron is appointed Kohen Gadol. That's when the Levim are inaugurated to take their role. If there's going to be a, a complaint, that's when it would have happened. The Ramban, even though there are some who learned that way, the Ramban does vehemently disagrees with that because he holds of the principle, we, we, we read the Torah chronologically. Unless we're forced into changing the order, if we're told the story here, we should assume it happened here. It happened after the sin of the spies. Which leads to the Ramban to then explain, if this is an issue, why, why did Korach wait to rebel now? Everything he complains about has been in place for months. And now he raises the issue about Aharon. Now he raises the issue about Moshe. Now he raises the issue about the firstborns. Where have you been? Says the Ramban, Korach is a classic opportunist. In the Ramban's language, it's here in source number two, says the Ramban, uh, for the 40 years, the people loved Moshe Rabbeinu at this point in time, as they leave Harsinai. The Shomu may love. Everybody listened to Moshe Rabbeinu. Everybody loved Moshe. Everybody listened to him. Had somebody rebelled against Moshe at the foot of our Sinai? The Ramban uses the colorful language. They would have stoned him. The Gemara likes to use that phrase. They would help people with their esrog, sukkah time. The Ramban says, somebody would have dared said a word of negativity about Moshe Rabbeinu at the foot of our Sinai during that year. Intolerable. Nobody would have stood for that. L'chein soval koirach gedulos aharon. Korach was patience. He tolerated the injustice that Aharon should be chosen as. He knew, don't say anything now, but just wait for the right time. All of the firstborns, he tolerated the fact that the entire tribe of Levi took the place of the firstborn. But then they moved away from Harsinai. And as they moved away from our Sinai, we had the three consecutive calamities. If you remember from two weeks ago, Parshas Baloscha, they ran out of our Sinai. They complained about the man. They complained about the meat. And then cracks begin. And the worst of them, last week's Parsha, the sin of the spies, of course, ends with the decree of death in the desert. No one is getting out of this entire generation. No one gets to see the land flowing with milk and honey. No one gets to see the fulfillment of all of these promises that they'd heard since Moshe returned in Mitzrayim over two years before. Everybody's dying. Korach jumps in and says, now's that I've been hanging on to this, but now's the time because now people are hopeless. Now the people are depressed. Now they think, now what's going to be? I'm not going in. Maybe my kids will go, but listen, I didn't even make it in. Who knows if my kids will make it in? Now Korach says, ah, at the end, says the Ramban, ah, matzah Korach makom lach loik al Now he sees, I could do this. I can make this work, and I could get the people uh, to follow after me. What is Korach? What is really driving him? What is driving Korach in this rebellion? There are a couple of comments, one, two comments from Rashi that we have to take a look at. These are, uh, they, you've probably heard these before, they get quoted regularly, but I want to focus on a specific aspect of them. As Korach's been waiting, uh, what's, what's really pushing him that he's been waiting for the time to jump in, and here he has his moment. Rashi asks the same question almost in identical ways, but he has two different, very important comments on this issue. Rashi here writes, very first pasuk in the parsha. Rashi asks, what did Kairach see? What was it that he needed to uh, address this issue and to uh, fight, take up this fight with, uh, with Moshe? Says Rashi, it was jealousy. It was jealousy that Korach was passed over for a certain position of power, a certain position of leadership. Rashi goes through, and I, I, this, I hope won't sound too confusing, 
I, I really meant to draw a little, a little genealogical chart to make it straightforward, but um, uh, we'll just visualize it. Yaakov Avinu has the son Levi. Levi, of course, is one of the 12 tribes. Levi has the son Kehos. Kehos is going to become the father of three, four, excuse me, four children, um, Amram being one of them, who are, these are, this is the line, Yaakov to Levi to Kehos, and then from Kehos, Kehos has four children. The eldest of Kehos's four children is Amram, as I mentioned, and Amram's children, Moshe and Aaron, took very important leadership roles. Moshe becomes the, the king, so to speak. Aaron, his brother, is the Kohen Gadol. Amram's next brother in line was Uziel, who is uh, Yitzar, excuse me, Yitzar. Yitzar was the father of Korach, and he's the second son. Th this entire family of Kehos, like all the families, had a Nasi appointed, had a leader, a tribal leader appointed. Since Amram, the eldest of the four sons, had the, his two children received big honors, Moshe and Aaron, it should have been, Korach reasoned, that the next son after Amram, Yitzar, a child from that line should be chosen as the, uh, as the Nasi. But indeed, when Moshe appoints all the different Nisim, it doesn't quite work out that way. But the fourth son um, actually is um, Elitzur, uh, excuse me, I chose the wrong name there, excuse me. Um, but instead, uh, Elitzafan ben Uziel. Uziel is the fourth son of the brothers, the fourth youngest brother. And it's Uziel's son, Elitzafan, who's chosen as the, as the Nasi. So in effect, it's Korach's younger cousin. And this says Rashi, Niskane al Nisi Uso shall Elitzafan ben Uziel. Korach couldn't tolerate that he is the son of the second son, and a son of the fourth son, his younger cousin, was chosen to be the, uh, the leader. Says, I can't tolerate this. I'm going to take up this issue with Moshe that he passed me over. It should have been my right to have this position of Nasi. What does he do? Rashi says, he gathered a number of people, 250 from some of the tribes that dwelled in the area near him, and he put them in talitot shekulan tcheles. He all dressed them up in a talus that was made up of entirely of tcheles. So they were wearing a garment, a shirt or a cloak, whatever they wore in those days, that was this blue-green, this tcheles thread. Bo v'yom dolifte motion. he comes before motion. he says, I have a shayla, Moshe. I have a question, a halachic shayla. Moshe says, yes, what's the question? And he says, you taught us, Moshe, that if I wear a garment, I have to put tzitzis on the garment. And from amongst the strings of my tzitzis, I have to have one thread that's tcheles. Moshe, I have a shayla. Look here. I put all 250 of these people, they were wearing hilbish, and he actually put them in a talus that was made of tcheles. And he said, does it need tzitzis or not? Moshe says, it's a garment. We don't care what color the garment is. A garment requires tzitzis. So Moshe says, chayev. And they all started to laugh, Rashi says. He said, uh, yeah, does this make any sense? A garment, you could fulfill the obligation of tzitzis with only one thread of tcheles in the strings. And here I have a garment made up of entirely of tcheles. And, and that's not enough. I still need to put strings and a single thread of tcheles. Doesn't make any sense. Moshe, you must have made this up. Now, if it was the topic of our talk tonight, we could go into depth. The morale has a long discussion of what was he thinking? Why is this a good argument? We'll leave that alone. The bottom line that Koch really wanted was he wanted everybody to laugh. He wanted to show in his mind that Moshe must be making this up. Our purpose, what drove Korach? He thought he should have been appointed a leader. He thought he should have been a Nasi. And he had, I have rights to it. My father is older than my younger cousin's father. Why did you pass over me? And he was jealous of that. And that drove him to uh, take up this issue. Rashi has a second comment here in source number four. He asks the question a little different. Rashi says, Korach was a bright guy. What did he see for this foolishness? What drove Korach into this? And here Rashi says, it was his eyes misled him. 
He saw a great chain of leaderships descending from him. Shmuel, Shmuel Anavi, the great prophet Samuel, who is weighted equal in weight to Moshe and Aaron. Not just one of the prophets, the prophet Shmuel comes from me, Korach said, a direct line. You can trace from me all the way down to Shmuel. He had a vision that from him was going to descend such great grace. And Omar Bishvilo and he said, I'm going to be saved. I'll be successful in my rebellion based on the merit of what's coming from me. And the groups, Chafdal and Mishmaros, people are going to be missing Nevi'im. Omar, he says, listen to this line that Rashi quotes. Can it be that there's such greatness descend, uh, destined to descend from me? And I should be silent in the face of not having a role? Therefore, he says, I'm going to take what's, what's mine. But he didn't understand that when Moshe said only one is going to be chosen, it wasn't going to be Korach. And all of his banim, all of Korach's sons were eventually going to do tshuva and rejoin the ranks of the Jewish people, but he was going to be lost personally forever. So Rashi gives us two things that are driving. He's been waiting. He's been holding. What's he holding on to? This jealousy that he was passed over, that he wasn't given this role that he thought he should have had. And then he sees descended from him was going to be such greatness. And so when the opportunity comes, he pounces. So first of all, just a fascinating comment on, uh, on, on these two things that Rashi says. I, I guess we all sort of do this sometimes. Korach thinks he has something coming to him from two angles. One, because of what his tata did, because of his father, and one because of his children. And in both instances, he says, it's Magili, it's something is coming to me. But he never stops to say, do I deserve this? Am I worthy of this? Both of his claims are, my father, therefore it should be mine. And one is, my kids, therefore it should be mine. It's not necessarily always how it works. The question is, do you deserve this, Korach? And his response actually displays, as the stipler going to point out, he lacks the one trait that's actually critical for leadership, and that is humility. If you run after kavod, if you're in it for the kavod, then you, you're the first one to be disqualified for any position of leadership. And so when Korach holds on to this, he passed me over. When you, so you ask the question, so knew why was he passed over? If his father was older, why didn't he get these things? He shows why. He shows the inability, that this running after, the inability to, uh, maybe I wasn't deserving, all of that, the running after the kavod, here, that's all that he's after. He disqualified himself. It was clear that he wasn't fit for this. But he does begin his rebellion because of this. I just, you know, they, they tell a famous rabbi joke. They tell a famous rabbi joke. Now, I don't know how many of you are rabbis, so how many of this, this applies to you. But they, they tell of a certain rav who came into a town. And he said, no, come into town. I'd like to meet uh, with the Rav of this town. A, a visiting Rav comes in. So he stops off in the uh, base medrash, the study hall. And he says, is the, is the Rav here? And the people pick up their heads and they say, the Rav of the town? Yeah, he's a nothing. He's a gornish. He doesn't know anything. He's a troublemaker. I don't know why you'd want to speak to him. He says, I'd like to just meet the Rav. You know where I could find him? They said, try the butcher. So the visiting Rav goes to the butcher. And, and he walks in and he says, is the Rav here? Butcher looks up from his chopping of his meat and he says, the Rav? You want to speak to the Rav? <laughs> I'm a Oretz. He's a no good Nick. He causes trouble. He's terrible. We wish he would just leave. You're looking for him. We're trying to get rid of him. Visiting Rav says, I just wanted to say, Shalom Aleichem to the Rav. You know where I could find him? He says, I don't know. Try the bakery. He goes to the bakery, the same exact story. The visiting Rav gives up every time, every place he goes, they yell, they scream. He's on his way out of town and he happens to come across the Rav. He says, oh, Shalom Aleichem, I've been trying to find you. Tell me, he says, what's, what's the deal? Why do you enjoy being a Rav in this place? So the Rav looks at him and says, what do you mean? It's all about the Kavod. Those of you in the Rav, will get it. 
<laughs> In any case, Karach, Rabbi Kelman is like falling off his seat. <laughs> so Karach is after this cover, no he's com- running. No, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Karach is running after his cover, but he's got a problem. Anybody who runs after cover, and all of us pursue cover in our own way. Listen, we are, we're all realists. We got our cover issues. But we know we're embarrassed when we run after cover. We know that we can't really claim any time that we're doing something that we're doing it for a cover. So you got to cover yourself up a little bit, right? You can never actually get up and start a machlokas and say, I'm fighting for my cover. It doesn't, even people who are after their cover know that it doesn't sound right. It's not the right way to go about it. Listen to a couple of comments we find from the, from the commentators that we've shown him and how, and how Korach addressed this issue. This was the pasuk that we started from, that in the morning of the big showdown, Korach gathered everyone together. Rashi comments, the divri letzonis, to start laughing and mocking Moshe. All night long, Korach is going around and telling stories. Kisvurin atem, he said to the people. Sha'alai levati, ani makbid. He said, do you think I'm doing this for me? Ani makbid el bishvil kulchem. I'm doing this for you, he said. I'm standing up for your children. Everyone had a bachor. Every family has a firstborn. You were supposed to have someone representing Hashem in the base Hamikdash in the Mishka, and it was taken from you and given to the tribe of Levi. Oh, the tribe of Levi. That's Moshe's tribe. I'm not here for me. He went around to all the people. I'm here to defend your rights. And that is what got everybody together. The Ramban makes the exact same comment in source number six. As Kara Karach Lachol Ho'eda, he gathered everybody, he said, Ki bekavod kulam hu mikane. Rashi and Rabban used the same language. He said, I'm doing this for you. And so the people were like, someone's fighting for us. This is a man of the people. So they gathered to see what was going to be the next day. They wanted to see. And in here, Korach touched on such a sensitive nerve by pos- positioning himself. I'm not after my own kavod. I'm really here for you guys. I'm the one taking on big business. I'm the one taking on Moshe and Aaron. No one else has the ability, the guts to do it. I'm doing it for you. And in that way, he's trying to hide his responsibility. Listen to one more comment here from the Maral. He never actually says what he's angry about. He never says, I'm fighting that I wasn't appointed to be the Nasi. What he does say in the beginning of the Pesukim, I didn't bring, there's so many Pesukim that we could have learned through the whole Parsha almost. He says, the, you took all of the Kahuna, Moshe and Aaron. Hainu Taima says in the you know why he focused on the kahuna? She'ilu ha'yuchokan al nisiyu s'shal alit safon. Had he said, I'm after the nis, I want to be the prince, ha'yu yisrael omrim l'chvodo asakarach. So all of Klal Yisrael would have been on to him in a minute. They would have said, you're doing this for yourself. Velo ha'yu yisrael nimshachin achrach. Nobody would have followed after him if they would have chapped that he was doing it for his own kavod. He had to position himself as doing it for their cover. One last point, and then we'll get to the whole, what we're really trying to share this from Banda Maral adds one last point to this. If you noted in Rashi's language, when we quoted it earlier, how did Korach uh, really introduce this? He said to Moshe, I have a Shaila. And he'll be shun, he dressed the 250 people up in clothing of Tcheles, and he stood them before Moshe, and he said, are, are these clothing Chayiv to have tzitzis. Do we have to put tzitzis on such a garment when it's made entirely out of tcheles? The language, the maral is always so careful on language. Rashi quoted the medrash, she's quoting from the sages, said, Hilbishon, Korach dressed the 250 people up in garments of tcheles. The maral asks, that's a strange thing. Why did he actually put them in clothing of tcheles? He really just should have gone to the base medrash, stood in front of Moshe and said, I have a shayla, I have a question. What would be the halach if somebody wore a garment of tcheles? And Moshe would have said, it's obligated to have tzitzis, and he would have laughed. Why did he put them in the clothing in order to ask that question? Moral says a brilliant thing. The, like the, he just sees how the sages pick up on how crowds work and rebellions foment. Says the Maral, source number eight here, Vim Tomar, Velishol Kach Just ask the question. You don't have to put them in the clothing. Says the Maral, 
Imagine the scene. Imagine if Korach would have stormed into the base magic and said, I have a question. So the 30 people learning in Kolo would have picked up their heads and said, no, what's the question? And Moshe would have said, yeah. And they would have said, what's the halacha? Does it need tzitzis? Does it not need tzitzis? And Moshe would have said it needs. And Korach would have laughed. And everybody, the 30 people in the room would have maybe chuckled and gone back to their learning. No, 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 no. That's not what Korach wanted. But what happens if you look outside of your tent while you're eating breakfast one morning and 250 people walk by wearing garments of tcheles? So you pick up your head at your breakfast table and you say, what's this? Why are they all wearing tcheles? And Korach would say, we have a shayla for Moshe. Oh, well, what are you going to do? You're going to put your breakfast down and see what's going on. And now that he's got five followers, the next tent that he passes, and now there's a whole tumult, and they're in the middle of breakfast, and, and there are 250 people wearing tcheles and 10 people following after them. He paraded them through the whole town, picking up people and people and people and people. By the time he gets to Moshe, he actually has myriads of people gathered together to find out what's going to be the halacha. So that when the answer is, you have to wear tzitzis and Korach starts to laugh, well, guess what happened then? Now it's not just 30 people in the room. Now it's 300,000 people. And the laughter is enormous. And he created the rebellion of against the authority of Moshe, he knew how to, you, to, you got to get the people there. So he claimed, I'm here, I'm here for you, he said. I'm defending your children, your honor. And then he figured out a way to get them all together. He dressed people up, 250 people in garments of tcheles to draw their attention, to come, to hear, to see. And now he asks the question and he starts the laughter. Now we're back to where we started, which was the middle. Korach gathers them all together, and Hashem says, I've had enough. He says, Shem says to Moshe and Aaron, you, Moshe and Aaron, separate from these people. I'm wiping them all out. And Moshe and Aaron respond, and they say, one person, one person sinned. How could you destroy all of these people? explains the Ramban, it's here, it's in source number nine, we have to see a little bit of insight because his words are so powerful. Says the Ramban, Hatam ki Moshe Originally, everybody was after Moshe and Aaron. Everybody followed after it. Everybody was believers of Moshe and Aaron. However, when Korach succeeded in gathering everybody together and said, I'm in it for you, and, and let's see what's gonna happen, and we're gonna do this big test, tomorrow's the showdown, he called all of the people, and he said, Ki kulam. I'm doing this for you. And the people were like, I don't know. Maybe Liros, Ulayi Yosher Kim. Maybe, maybe Hashem will indeed give our firstborns back the Avoda. Maybe, maybe it's right that Moshe shouldn't have given all this authority to Aharon, his brother, and, and the firstborns lost their right. Let's see what happens. Says the Ramban that moment that the people said, let's see what happens, they were also deserving of destruction. That they followed after the rebellion, that Korach had succeeded in masking his own desire for Kavod, and he hid it in the garb of, I'm really here for you. And then the people went after and they said, let's see, I don't know, maybe, let's see what happens. The fact that they went to see what happens Right there. The fact that they went, the fact that they were interested, the fact that they entertained the possibility that indeed maybe Korach is right, that was already rejecting the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu and they were all deserving of destruction. That's Hashem's opening line. They deserve it. How do Moshe and Aaron counter this? Moshe and Aaron limdu aleim schus Moshe and Aaron found a merit for the people and said, Shalochot b'maise. But in action, indeed, nobody did anything. Nobody's picked up, no one did anything, Ela Korach. There's only one person who actually did something, Vehu Hagorim, Vehu Hamefat. He's the cause. And he seduced all the people to follow after him. And therefore, he's the only one who really deserves a punishment because he's the instigator. So that's true. People followed and they should not have. And it was a mistake. And they're deserving a punishment. 
but there was one person who really dragged them into it. There was one person who thought this through, who fooled them. And because it was that one person who's really the instigator, that person should get it and not everybody else. And the Ramban concludes, Vizu derech mevakshe rachamim. This is a pattern. This is the way people who beseech mercy from Hashem do so. They try to remove the burden from the people and put it on the person responsible. Yes, a lot of people join together. You know, I don't know how many of you are classroom teachers, but you can imagine a classroom scenario where you have one or two uh, clowns in the classroom who rile everybody up. And they get the whole classroom into doing whatever one of a thousand things that goes on in a high school or elementary school class. They're all doing it. And the teacher walks in and it's a balagan. It's a mess. And everybody's involved. But it's also clear that there were only two people who really got this going. There were two people who riled everybody up, who brought the materials, who thought of the idea. Yes, they wouldn't have worked if it was just two. They needed all of their friends. But these are the two problems. Says the Ramban, it's the derech mevakshe rachem to lighten the load of the people and isolate the real problem. True, the people made a mistake, but they were just dragged along, put it on the heads of the one who are really responsible. And therefore, Moshe and Aaron say to the Ribbonah Shalom, Hashem, you're right. All of the people came to find out. All of the people went to look and see, maybe. And they were wrong for even thinking that. But come on, nobody really did anything other than Korach, and therefore Ha'isha Echad Yechta. Can one person be the real sinner here and everybody gets? It's not fair. It's not right. That's not your way. And Hashem listens to that. That's how the Ramban sees that incident, and he brings another story from Tanakh as evidence of this, which is a different type of story and really has tremendous consequences that are worth spending a few minutes, the time that we have left, going through the second story. V'chein Omar David. Says the Ramban, we find this exact idea in the very end, the last parak of Sefer Shmuel Bet. We have a count. David HaMelech takes a count of the Jewish people. And uh, uh, the, the count is described by Chazal and Mestachas Brachos as an inappropriate count. It's inappropriate, not just because there was no need for the count. He didn't need to know how many people were in the name. It was for no purpose, but he counted them directly and not using the Chatzis Shekel method that was required. The Ramban discusses that Moshe, that David and Melech thought maybe that only applied in the times of the desert, made a mistake, and the people all go out to be counted rather than to give a chatzi shekel, and a terrible plague breaks out. The Navi describes 70,000 Jews die in a plague that's a result of this particular plague, a mistake that David and Melech makes by counting the people. And David and Melech, after already 70,000, and it's getting worse, offers up the following prayer. It's here on the bottom of, uh, if, if, if lay out the same way that I do here, Hinei Anochi Chatasi. David HaMelech says to Hashem, I'm the sinner here. Vanochi Ha'avisi. I am the one to be blamed. Ve'ela Hatzon Me'asu. The flock, the people, what did they do? They allowed themselves to be counted, but I was the one who asked them to be counted. Sure, they should have given a chatzi shekel like they knew they should have, but it was my fault. Tehina Yodcha Bi Ubeves Avi. Says David HaMelech, punish me. Punish my father's home. Leave the people alone. Says the Ramban, where is David HaMelech coming from? The people also should have given the Chatzit Shekel. They made a mistake. But David HaMelech is saying, crossing over here to the top of the next page here, um, you know what? David Amalek didn't say not to give a chatzi shekel, so the people should have done so. But David Amalek says, Take it out on me, leave the people alone. Now, says the Ramban in this, in this story, so that we see in the same way that Moshe and Aaron in our parsha look at Korach and say, He's the one responsible, it's on his head, leave the people out of it. David HaMelech himself says about himself, he says, I'm responsible, leave everyone else out of it. That is leadership. Korach is trying to fool everyone into joining him so that he can get his kavod. David HaMelech says, I made an error. 
everybody else followed along. It's true they followed in a way that they shouldn't have. It's true they deserve to be punished. But he says, you have to stop the plague. What they do, it's on me. Take it out on me, not on everybody else. And that's the level of responsibility to say, I'll shoulder this. I'm responsible. And to be able to admit to that, not just to say, I'm also responsible. I'm the cause of this. And I am therefore ready to accept the punishment, but leave everybody else alone. That is this, uh, the leadership of a David Amalek and the Ramban sees. Where did he get that from? From the argument that Moshe and Aaron make to say, this is Korach's thing. He's the one responsible for dragging everybody together into this and therefore leave him alone. Once the Ramban addresses this story, there's one other point which must be mentioned. I feel like this is, uh, there's like a mitzvah to learn this Ramban every Parshish Korach because the Ramban discusses this episode of David Amelach counting the people inappropriately, again, as a proof for the idea of how he understands Moshe and Aaron's argument of it's one sinner, leave everybody else alone. Yes, they're the sinners, but they're not the cause. Put it on the cause only. That story begins with the following Pasuk, the story of David Amelach. This is Perak Chavdalit, Pasuk Aleph, the first opening Pasuk of the last Perak in Shmuel Beis. By Yosef Af Hashem Lachros Bi Yisrael, Hashem's anger again flared against the Jewish people by Yosef as David Bahem. And he instigated David to make a mistake with them. Very strange Pasuk. Meaning, if the Pasuk doesn't began, begin and David Amalek made a mistake and counted the Jewish people. The story begins, Hashem was again angry at the Jewish people and caused David, because of his anger at the Jewish people, caused David to make a, a mistake that would eventually lead to the Jewish people's punishment in this plague. Very odd opening of a story. What, what's the again? What else was he angry for? And he caused David to make a mistake. Rashi there says, Lo yadoti alma. Rashi says, I don't know what the Pasuk means. Rashi says that Hashem was angry again. The, the previous Prakim don't discuss anything that would lend itself to this kind of opening. So what was Hashem angry at that he now furthered his anger that he needed to cause David to make this mistake? Says the Ramban, one of the most powerful comments I find every year, this is just, I, uh, I, I, I shudder reading this Ramban. Says the Ramban, I'll tell you what I think, says the Ramban. The anger that Hashem had was on the delay of building the base Amikdash. Klal Yisrael is now in Eretz Yisrael over 400 years from the time that Yoshua led the Jewish people in in the beginning of Sefer Yoshua. It's 400 years we've been through Sefer Yoshua. We've been through Sefer Shoftim. We've been through Sefer Shmuel Aleph. We're at the end of Shmuel Bet. So the Shmuel Aleph was the same Shmuel, you know, but it's, a, it's all of his years. 400 plus years the Jewish people are in the land and there's no base amikdash. Shahaya ha'aron holech me'ol ha'ol keger ba'aretz. The aron, housing the luchos, travels from place to place like a stranger in the land with no home. Ve'ein ha'shvatim mis'oririm. Le'mor, none of the shvatim arouse themselves to say, nidrosh es Hashem v'nivne ha'bayis lishmo. We need to find a place for Hashem. We need to build him a home. No one fulfilled that which the Pasuk says, seek out his presence. Nobody did so. David David himself had that thought at the end of his days. And Hashem said, you can't build the base on Mikdash. You have too much blood on your hands. And therefore, even when finally somebody did, like David HaMelech, but he couldn't do it and he needed to wait another generation, says the Ramban, had the Jewish people desired it, and they on their own initiated and came to David and said, how can it be? How can it be that Hashem doesn't have a home? How can it be that we're comfortable? We're affluent. We're stable, and he doesn't have a home. Had that happened, <laughs> the base Amikdash would have been built during the days of the Shoftim, or Bimei Shaul Melech, or even during the days of David, because it wouldn't have been called David's house. It would have been the people's house, because they would have initiated. 
Kasher ha'am lo hishgichu. But since the people did not pay attention, the David ha'yam hashgiach, and it was David who paid attention. Ume oirer, hu asher heichin hakol. He prepared it. He built it. It couldn't be done by him, and therefore, it has to be on Shlomo al kain hayo haketzef aleihem. When the pasuk begins, Hashem was angry at the people and caused David to sin. The anger was because the people had ignored Hashem and his house. They were paying attention to their own homes, to their own affluence and stability. And nobody thought about, how come there's no Beis HaMikdash? What are we doing here? Why is this not happening? No one even thought it. And therefore, when that Pasuk, Pasuk begins, that Hashem's anger flared again at the people, and he caused David to make a mistake, that's the reference of what we were saying. Therefore, at the end of that parak, if you take a look at the very end of the last Pasuk in Sefer Shmuel Beis, at the end of the story of the plague, it ends with Hashem telling David HaMelech to go to a certain place and to bring a carbon, and that was the place which was eventually going to be the place of the Beis HaMikdash. How did David find the field that was going to become the, at the centerpiece of the hilltop that would be the Beis HaMikdash, it was only through plague and destruction. Why did we only discover the place of the Beis HaMikdash, says the Ramban, through plague and death and destruction? Because nobody thought to do it on their own. And when nobody thought about it, so Hashem said, uh, yeah, this is how it's going to happen. But you should have done this on your own. And that's why the, the Pasuk begins, this whole story, this whole story begins with the anger of Hashem uh, flaring up. A very powerful Ramban about the way that David Amela finally finds the location of the Beis Hamikdash and the, the well, what should we call it? I don't want to speak badly about Klal Yisrael, but the Ramban used the language already. The, the, the ignoring of Hashem's house traveling around like a ger ba'ar, it's like a stranger in the land without a home. Lo his oiriru. Nobody aroused their souls to say, this shouldn't be like this. And therefore, we only found the place through, uh, through the destruction and the plague of this particular episode. All of this was only a total side point, the Rabban says. The real reason why he discussed this episode is because David Amelech stops the plague by saying, put it on me. I'm the one really responsible for this. And since I'm the one responsible for it, it should be on my head and not on the people's head. And that's the way the Ramban understands Moshe and Aaron's argument about Korach. Leave the people alone. It's true they followed after him, but that's because they were fooled by his claim of being a, a people for the people, being a champion of the people, that he was fighting for their kavod. So they fell after him. Leave them alone. They were fooled by him. It's really all on Korach's head. And that's the argument we see shirking responsibility, taking responsibility. Korach tried to push it. Oh, no, it's not about my kavod. It's about everybody else. And emotion Aaron put it back on his head. And that's what David Amalek himself does as a leader. He says, Hashem, put it on me. And then once, once he begins discussing that parasha, the Rabban then leads into this lengthy discussion of the real reason why that entire plague happened, that that required David to take it on himself, was the people themselves messed up. They didn't care enough to look beyond themselves and say, Ma'yem beis Hashem, what's going to be with the house of Hashem? We need to do something. We need to do something about it. I am not, I will, I will just conclude, advocating that we should storm the Temple Mount and rebuild the third base of Mikdash. I am advocating to arouse our souls, to yearn, to desire. When will it be that Hashem will have His palace and His presence back amongst the Kali Yisrael? As the Gemara says in Masech HaShavas, one of the six questions we're all going to be asked at the end of our time here in this world, when we uh, stand in front of the heavenly court and we're asked six questions, and one of those questions is, See peace of the Yeshua? Did you yearn for redemption? Did you think about it? Did you want it? Were you pained over the fact that we live in the exile and we're not in Yerushalayim? We're not in Eretz Yisrael. There's no base on Mikdash. Did you think about it? Maybe now is not our time. We can't, we're not yet ready to build it like they were in the times of David Amalek. But just like in the times of David Amalek, they were chastised for not yearning for it, wanting it. That's our role, to, to daven, as we say the words, but do we think about what we say? Return. We want to see us. We want to see the sprouting again of redemption. That is certainly the job that we have as we learn from that story, all of which was brought in through this 
co- connection that the Ramban makes between the responsibility of the leader of something in the same way that Korach had the blame on him and David Amalek takes it on himself as well. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Kalman. So appreciate the opportunity to learn with you this, uh, this evening. And uh, I guess I'm supposed to take time for some questions. Great, thank you very much. Yes, there are a couple of questions in the chat box if anybody wants to speak up. Rabbi, you see the questions? You want me to read them to you? Yes, I see them. I see them. I see them. Right. Um, uh, so, hold on one second. Here it is. The top here. Okay. Uh, moved away from Sinai, then rebels. That the color thing God was changed and more powerful. Um, that one I'm not sure how to answer. Um, I don't know that God was changed or more powerful near. I, I think it was the way the the way I understood from the Ramban was a matter of the people were ripe to follow after him. The people never would have gone for such an argument while they were still at Har Sinai, and therefore he had to eat it. But when they left Har Sinai and problems started amongst the people, and then the hate of the Miraglim, the sin of the of the spies, then he had uh, a ripe audience. That's how I understood that. Um, no, Ramban thinks the temple would have been earlier, but in Yerushalayim. Meaning they should have asked, yes, they should have asked, the Rabban understands, they should have gone to Dov- to the Shoftim, they should have gone to Shaul, they should have gone to David and said, we need to build a place that make touch. And if they would have done so, then they would have had the place revealed to them in the same way that David needed to have it revealed to him. It would have been, they would have, however, he doesn't say how, they would have found the right place, but it would have come from the people. It wouldn't be called the base David, it would have been called the house of the Jewish people, the house of Hashem belonged to everybody. It wasn't David who would have built it, but it always would have been in, in Yerushalayim. It just should have been built earlier than after 400 years of living in the land. There's one okay. last comment. Yeah, yeah. And they're all like the people asked for a king. Okay. I, I guess you address that. Um, at the, okay. Um, Shirley, do you have, I see your hand is up. So I don't know if you want to speak up. Is that or. Um, okay. Feel free. But uh, I think that's how that, but okay. Rabbi, thank you for that very uh, informative and, and powerful shear and uh, a pleasure. Um, next Thursday night, Rabbi Moshe Shulman from the Young Israel of St. Louis. Uh, those who are in Toronto, of course, remember him for his many years of service here in, in, in Toronto at Sher Shemaim. Uh, he'll be speaking next next, next Thursday, night, please God. Uh, tomorrow morning, my, my Pirkei Abbot here at 9.30 a.m. Everybody welcome. And uh, we'll be beginning again Sunday morning, Rabbi Liebtag, his shear on Sefer Dvarim at 11.15. And uh, everybody welcome and our uh, host of Shirim um, throughout the week. Uh, I'll give you a quick announcement um, here, just you're hearing it first because we just sort of organized it um, starting in a, probably a week and a half or so. Uh, Rabbi Alex Israel um, is going to give a seven part series on the thought of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. So um, watch out for that. Uh, just uh, people who come get advance notice and warning. Okay, Rabbi, you can, you can uh, let people know about that too. That's all. I always say our best form of advertising is word of mouth. That's why I ask, I'll be glad. Just invite one friend, every invite one friend. That's the best way to grow. But anyways, um, a pleasure to see everybody and I uh, want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom and uh, all the best. Okay, and Korach, uh, Rabbi, I thought you were going to tell the joke about the guy who has only one speech, you know, on, on Korach, you know that joke, you have to know a little bit of Yiddish for that one, right? That gives a crack, then, you know, you know that story. I don't think so. Oh, so if, I'm going to probably blow it. So somebody help me out. But uh, it's the guy, um, the Maggi comes in, the big rub, and he thinks he's a, you know, he, he pretends he's a big Tamachacham and he, he doesn't know anything. He has only one drasha. I think this is how it goes. So he would say something, and he would always do something about Korach. He, he would cough, so he said, Korach, ah, Korach, and, so, and then talk, okay, let's talk about Korach. So he had, so every drush could be a Korach, but I think I blew the joke, but uh, I wasn't prepared, I'm sorry, but uh, Kavod, yeah, yeah, you do it for the Kavod, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll, I'll, you, you know what? Better to be yelled at than ignored, that's what they always say, when people talk lush and har about you and criticize you, Baruch Hashem, at least they don't ignore you. So I guess that's the cover that, uh, you know, everybody wants. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's, uh, it's blessed those people who don't run after covers. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay. And thank you, everybody. Laila Tov, everybody. Thank you, Chodesh Tov. Thank you. Chodesh Tov. That's right. Chodesh Tov. Yeah. Okay.
Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, good night. Thank you. Good Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>